Welcome to Renegade Inc, the show that allows us to think differently. When we see images of poverty in countries that are rich in resources, there's confusion. When we hear of the massive disparity between the world's rich and poor, many people wonder why. Our understandable reaction is that the system has failed, but that's not the case. Actually, the system is working perfectly. Inequality and poverty rage on because the economic rules have been rigged in favour of the people, organisations and countries who wrote them. Is it now time for a truly democratic rewrite? If so, what's standing in the way? And how do we rethink the constraints of an outdated economic order that has caused so much suffering? When you hear that eight of the richest men in the world possess as much wealth between them as the poorest half of the world's population, you either think that the statisticians have got their sums wrong or we have levels of inequality never before witnessed in human history. Sadly, the statisticians' sums are correct. So, joining me to work out how we got here and how we begin to redress the balance is the writer and anthropologist Jason Hickel, whose book, The Divide, debunks the myths that have been peddled around global inequality and poverty. Welcome, uh, and thank you for swinging by. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, for me, the book comes out of a very personal experience, a personal background, I guess. So I was born and raised in rural Swaziland. My parents were medics, and I was really kind of up close and personal with, um, with really devastating poverty. It's a very poor country. And uh, I grew up in the middle of the AIDS crisis where it was the worst of any country in the world. Then I moved to the United States in the late 90s, and I did my, did my university and my PhD there. And um, I was really confronted with totally the opposite. I mean, a world of real excess, um, very high incomes in aggregate. And, uh, and I was scrambling for explanations for how this massively divided world came to be, how the stark contrast between rich countries and poor countries um, came to be. And at the time, I was really persuaded initially by the story that we're told by the development industry, which is that all poor countries need is a little bit of aid to help them up the development ladder. Poor countries are poor because of their own internal policy problems. They need advice from the West, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that persuaded me. I worked in India and Swaziland again after I graduated, but I was never really satisfied with, uh, with the answers the development industry was giving. Why, why was that? Um, what, what, was, what was the moment where you started to think, hang on, this isn't right? I guess it was just recognizing that despite decades of interventions and trillions of dollars of, of aid disbursements from rich countries to poor countries, nothing was really getting any better, right? So the global poverty headcount today is uh, 4.3 billion people. That's the number of people in the world that don't have enough money to make basic ends meet that 60% of the world's population. So there's, there's something really fundamentally wrong with the way the global economy works, and I wanted to be able to understand what that was. As opposed to do this sort of on the surface handouts uh, that a lot of organizations now do. Exactly, yeah. So, so the dominant understanding is that poor countries are poor uh, because of their own internal policy failures, et cetera. Uh, but that's a very narrow and ahistorical view. So if we broaden our view out a little bit and take history into account, what we see is that poor countries are poor and remain poor uh, because of a global economic system that has been designed over about 500 years since the onset of colonialism to the trade policies of today, intentionally designed to serve the interests of a handful of rich countries at the expense of the vast majority of the rest of the world. So what you're saying, though, is that the system hasn't failed, because often what we hear is the system's failed. And man on the street understandably says, well, the system's failed because they see terrible pictures from Africa of people starving, for instance in Sudan uh, of late, and they say, well, that, that's failure, that's clear failure. But what you're saying is the systems work perfectly according to the rules that the system's been set upon. That's right, and it really does all have to do with the rules. And so if we start to examine that, then we see that the system is working, in fact, perfectly. It's serving who it was designed to serve. The only problem is that uh, that we, we're left with a global economy that just doesn't serve the vast majority of humanity. And to me, that's a real crisis. It's the 21st century. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have 60% of the world's population in grinding poverty. We're seeing the income gap between rich countries and poor countries is not diminishing. Uh, it's been increasing dramatically, not just uh, during colonialism, but since the 1960s, the income gap between North and South has tripled. Uh, so that's really, I mean, that's dramatic. And uh, with, with figures like that on the table, then it's very clear that uh, there's something fundamentally wrong, and it won't be changed with a bit of aid here and there. We, we need to fundamentally restructure the global economy and make it fair. Your central thesis is that there's nothing natural about poverty. So what we're looking at here is structurally determined behavior, um, and we, that's why we're getting these outcomes. Just go into a little bit of detail of how that happened. So one of the dominant understandings out there that I seek to, to question in the book is the idea that uh, that rich countries are, are giving aid to poor countries in any meaningful quantity, right? right. So 
Uh, in fact, there is a lot of aid given. It's about $130 billion per year transferred from rich countries to poor countries every year. And that's an enormous amount of money. That's is, is it given? Is it transferred? Or are they loans? So a lot of it is loans, some of it is right, charity, right. some so of let's it is get tied that, aid, right, that's true. Right, so we, but the language is Absolutely. important, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. what happens in the UK is the right-wing press say we're giving an aid deal to, for instance, Pakistan, right. and you can see in all the comments, why are we giving, why are we giving all this right, aid? Right. And you say, well, no, hang on, it's, not, it's actually a loan. Yeah. And, and there are debt strings. Absolutely. And, and also, a, a lot of the, the aid that's given comes with conditions attached, right? right. That the, the, the recipients of the aid have to um, implement certain economic policies uh, or um, have to vote with the donor country in UN agreements and so on. Right. So, so it's, there's no free lunch. There's no free lunch. But even if we assume that there, there was a free lunch, yeah. that $130 billion really are being transferred for free from rich countries to poor countries, even that is misleading because, in fact, vastly more than that amount uh, flows the opposite direction from right. poor countries to rich countries um, uh, for all sorts of reasons. The like biggest, what? Well, so the, the biggest one probably is illicit financial flows, um, most of which are, um, are in the form of tax evasion by major multinational companies operating in the global south, headquartered often in rich countries, that are effectively stealing wealth um, their, their profits from Global South countries and stashing them away in tax havens because of rules brought in by the WTO that make this practice possible. And the WTO um, is? The World Trade Organization, right, right? Uh, which, which basically governs the rules of global trade for the most part, um, centrally. And uh, at the WTO, it's a, it's a very anti-democratic institution, actually. The, um, the, the vast majority of the bargaining power has long been in the hands of a handful of global north countries. And so they get to ter determine rules that end up serving their interests. And that's, that's one of the reasons that we see uh, these illicit financial flows in such magnitudes. I mean, uh, these financial flows outstrip the aid budget by a factor of 10. So for every dollar of aid that poor countries receive, they lose $10 in illicit financial flows. Uh, to tax havens by multinational companies. Right. Another one is debt service, right? So poor countries pay $200 billion per year in debt service to, uh, to banks in rich countries. Um, that's just the interest payments on debts, many of which have been pay, uh, paid off already many times over, some of which were accumulated by illegitimate dictators. Um, so, and that's just a direct cash transfusion um, from, uh, from poor to rich that outstrips the aid budget by a factor of two. So we need we, to be... we never get that context in, exactly. in the media. They, they never the, the media will never write. Yeah, okay, this is happening, but well, this is the thing. So the the, the 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 discourse of aid is a very powerful narrative. It's convinced us all that rich countries have nothing to do with the impoverishment of poor countries. That we're basically uh, in a position of benevolence, reaching out generously across the divide to give of our surplus. You turn when, that on its head. When in fact the opposite is true. Right. And, and this is not an ideological perspective. This is, uh, this is uh, rooted in data that's very clear. And I trace this data up, up until even the most recent figures we have last year um, showing this reverse flow of wealth um, around the world. So I think that's a really important antidote to the dominant narrative of, of, of charity and aid and development that were served in the media. What's been the reaction to that work that you've done, that research? What, what has the, the broad reaction been? Because it is thinking very differently. Yeah, I think that actually uh, people have been excited about it, in fact. Um, we, we see kind of a shift in people's consciousness since 2008 with the financial crisis. People realize that, um, that poverty and inequality in their own countries are not a natural phenomenon. They're being generated by policies introduced by, by bankers, politicians, et cetera. Um, and so they're looking for the political determinants of their suffering, right? And so when people hear that, uh, that the same thing applies to the global stage, that global poverty in poor countries is a direct consequence of intentional policies, then that's not surprising to them anymore, right? There really is kind of an awakening to the fact that this is the case. I mostly interact with students, right, at the LSE where I teach uh, and, and giving talks around. And I, I feel that this message really does resonate. And even among, among people who you might no not normally expect that kind of response from them, uh, so I'm, I'm very hopeful about that. I think that, the, that there's a lot of passion in our, in our communities, in our country, for trying to make the world a better place. That, that passion right now and the, and the money that is behind it is misguided. We're, we're, it's all being devoted and channeled into charity, which is not solving the problems. Uh, that is patently true. So it's time for us to start addressing the deeper structural causes of the problems that we care so much about. And once we do that, then it's going to change the game. What is your view on... Uh NGOs and these grassroots organizations which are put in other countries to solve the, the poverty problem. Have you got a view on them? Yeah, I, I used to work for them and so I, I'm empathetic to what they're trying to do. I think most of them are, they have their hearts in the right place. And in some cases, look, let's be honest, they're doing, they're doing good on the ground. They're improving people's lives in sort of a, in a, a, in a micro sense at least. But the problem here is that 
they participate in this discourse that, um, that the problem is not structural. The problem can be addressed with a bit of aid, a bit of advice, et cetera. Um, and so in that sense, I think they really miss the point about what's causing poverty in the first place. So the problem is, this is the problem that I discovered working for these organizations, is that when you start to push uh, them in this direction, then a lot of people in those organizations actually want to take those steps. But the problem is that their, their, their donors stand to lose quite a lot if, uh, if NGOs start uh, trying to transform, uh, start trying to lobby to transform the global economy to make it fair because um, their donors benefit from the status quo effectively. So there really is kind of a disincentive for them to, to make real change. And that I think is a, is a problem we have to confront. Awkward conversations with donors. Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe donors need awkward conversations. I would say they do. Because, because they, 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 they don't, they understand, the donors understand. I suppose um, in some cases probably they do. Look, let's look at Bill Gates, for example. Let's look at Bill Gates. Let's look at Bill Gates. Yes. Look, in many ways, um, he's done a lot of good. He gives a lot of money to, um, uh, to charity around the world, uh, focused on trying to improve the plight of the poorest in the world, right? right. Um, uh, and specifically in public health. But at the same time, where does, where does his wealth come from? It, co it comes from patents that he holds um, on, on technology he's, he's designed with Microsoft. And, uh, and the reason he's able to accumulate so much is because the patent laws um, are, are super strict uh, and allow him to siphon immense amounts of, re of rents from these patent laws, right? These patent laws are enshrined in the trade-related aspects of international property, uh, intellectual property rights agreement in the WTO. And Microsoft uh, lobbied very hard for those uh, patent laws to be strengthened and increased, right? Those are the exact same patent laws that prevent uh, millions of people in the global south from accessing um, basic generic medications um, and other basic uh, development technologies that they need. Um, Why? Uh, well, because they have to pay such enormous licensing fees to the companies that own those patents. Who owns the patents? In the case of medicines, it's pharmaceutical companies, mostly in the US, for example. So, for example, the AIDS crisis is a great example here. You could have basically prevented much of the AIDS crisis from happening if, uh, if people in countries like Swaziland, where I'm from, um, had access to generic drugs that would be used to treat HIV uh, and prevent it. Uh, but those drugs were not allowed to be imported into Swaziland because of rules brought in under the TRIPS agreements under the WTO that were lobbied for by Gates. So Gates is aware that the way that the trade system is designed when it comes to patent laws uh, serves his interests and also um, hurts the interests of millions of poor people around, around the world. Uh, and yet that never comes into his discourse about, about the causes of poverty. He, he removes that from the scene. He, he offers an apolitical solution um, and chooses to focus on, on charity instead. Is that why when we look at Bill Gates, when he's made this claim that he's gonna solve a lot of poverty and, and he's gonna improve world health broadly, is that why when we look at him we think, hurry up? Because, <laughs> right. he, because he seems to have been taking a long time to do it. Surely, you know, again, if you put yourself in that position and think, well, I've got all this money, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start firing it at the problem quite a lot quicker than, than he's spending it at the moment. Absolutely, but the truth is, actually, you don't even need you don't even need charity or aid in order to to eradicate poverty around the world, right? Um, it literally is a matter of making the correct targeted intervention. So, for example, the international debt system, which has been a stone around the necks of developing countries since the 1980s, basically means that rich countries, that, that technocrats and bankers in rich countries get to decide the, uh, the macroeconomic policy decisions of developing countries because they're their creditors. As a result, they impose economic policies that end up being detrimental to, say, per capita income growth in developing countries. So if you were to do this, to take the simple step of eradicating that debt, um, or even just starting with eradicating the, seven, the $700 billion of dictator debt that has, is a holdover from the past, then you would free poor countries up to stop spending all their money in interest payments to uh, rich banks, and instead to spend that on public health and education and so on, um, which they were doing successfully in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s after the end of colonialism, before the debt crisis hit. The debt crisis basically stopped them from, from doing that, forced them to channel all of their assets and resources um, into debt repayments to the North. That one solution itself would have a dramatic impact in reducing, in reducing poverty around the world. Uh, it wouldn't even require a single dollar of foreign aid. And it's a brutally simple policy. Absolutely, and there are, many, there are many others that we could look at as well. We'd have to look at some of the other major drivers of impoverishment. So for example, the, um, the World Bank and the IMF, uh, the International Monetary Fund, these are the institutions that, uh, that determine the rules of the global economy. And interestingly, they're also, like the WTO, profoundly anti-democratic. So the US has a veto power over all major decisions made by the World Bank and the IMF. The Global South, which has 80% of the world's population, has only 50% of the voting power in these institutions. So effectively, um, 
rich countries are getting to control the rules of the global economy through these institutions in a way that ends up benefiting them. So another simple solution would simply be to democratize the World Bank and the IMF. I mean, democracy is a solution here. Once poor countries have, uh, have the right to uh, a fairer voice in the institutions of global governance, then, uh, then we're making enormous progress against the problem. Monopoly and rents, wow. Uh, and, and democracy, monopoly, rents and democracy. We're gonna talk uh, way more about all those things in the second half, Jason, thank you for this. That's it for this half, join us after this short break for more from Jason Hickel. Welcome back to Renegade Inc., the show that allows us to think differently. Before we talk more about the global economic divide with Jason Hickel, let's have a quick look at this week's Renegade Inc. index. Let's start, as we always do, with our favourite tweets. First up is from Vice UK. The West extorts way more money from Africa than it gives in aid, which typifies our first half, does it not? Right. You, don't, you, you agree with that. Next from Nigel Daring, Africa is dependent on foreign aid. It should be the converse. Foreign lands should be dependent on African aid. Africa has the resources. Having lived there, again, we're not saying anything which is too it's radical. True, it's a true story. The West does rely on resources from the rest of the world. Yeah. But we've spun it brilliantly to make it look as though somebody else is dependent. Exactly. From Silas Majamberi, half a million lives will be lost this year to preventable, curable disease. Malaria in arguably the richest continent, Africa. And finally, uh, this isn't a tweet. Actually, it's Brian Kavanagh's uh, Twitter biog and it says on it capture land and natural resource rents publicly why leave these unearned incomes to the 0.1% and their cronies and this plays hard to your uh, book the divide doesn't it be unearned income unearned increment in Africa trickling up into the developed north our book of the week this week is Bad Samaritans, The Myth of Free Trade and the Secret History of Capitalism by Hajun Chang. Neoliberal economists argue that only unfettered capitalism and wide open international trade can lift struggling nations out of poverty. Chang blasts a hole in this argument showing that today's economic superpowers from the US to Britain to his native South Korea all attained prosperity by shameless protectionism and government intervention in industry. We have conveniently forgotten this fact, telling ourselves a fairy tale about the magic of free trade. Both justice and common sense, Chang argues, demand that we reevaluate the policies we force on other nations that are struggling to follow in our footsteps. We think it's an excellent read. Get a copy. Now, uh, Jason, you have to pitch your book, The Divide. You have about, I don't know, 12, 15, 20 seconds um, <laughs> uh, to sell this, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, uh, pitch it to us. Global poverty numbers are rising. They have been since the 1980s. Uh, the gap between rich countries and poor countries has been growing uh, since the 1960s, has now tripled since then. We need to understand why this is happening. I wrote this book uh, to be a clear and accessible um, account of how our world came to be as divided and unequal as it is today. So give us the global sort of uh, uh, and historical context from colonialism maybe right through to here of why we're here and why this inequality and poverty still exists. Right. What's interesting to me today is that we're he we have these figures like Boris Johnson and Marie Le Pen, um, et cetera, coming out on the record in the 21st century saying that uh, you know, France and Britain should not be ashamed of their colonial legacy, if anything, uh, it's too bad that France and Britain are not still in control of their colonies as they would be better off than they are today, right? Um, and I just find this to the be... The irony is France and Britain are in control of their own economies. <laughs> it's it's a good question. So um, th this is just the most, uh, the, the most dangerous form of historical amnesia, I think. Uh, I mean, all of the facts prove Boris completely wrong. So, uh, for example... Um, in India, right, we, we often hear this nostalgic uh, narrative that England brought the railroads to India and brought them democracy and development and so on. And it's just, I mean, they brought railroads, yes, but the purpose of the railroads, of course, was to extract resources into the British-centered economy. More importantly, on the question of development, let's look at the numbers. From, from 1757, the beginning of, colo of British colonialism in India, to the very end in 1947, during that entire period, there was no increase in per capita income in India. In fact, uh, in the last half of the 19th century, uh, per capita incomes declined by 20%, uh, and so did life expectancies. In the late 19th century, there was, um, uh, because of British agricultural policy and, and enclosure of common resources in India, there was a famine that killed off 30 million Indians uh, in the late 19th century. This is not covered in British history textbooks, 
so on, on, what, on what basis can we say that, that, uh, that colonialism helped to develop India? The, the answer is the opposite. If we look at the record, you know, um, Asia and Africa during the colonial period, their incomes grew at about 0.5% per year in aggregate, right? Uh, during the same period, the incomes of, of uh, the colonial powers grew at about 1.5% per year. So that's a major driver of inequality right there, as we can see. So colonialism was a time of unmitigated crisis for the colonies. Let's get that out of the table. Now, what's interesting is that after the end of colonialism, uh, in the independence era, then Global South countries uh, elected democratic leaders that had very progressive views on uh, improving the lives of ordinary people through better wage laws, land reform, nationalizing resources, uh, protecting their own industries, uh, and growing them to compete on the world stage. And they were remarkably successful with these policies. Um, they saw um, per capita income growth rates go up to 3.2%, which was double what the West was achieving during their own industrial revolution. It was a real development miracle. And you would think that rich countries like the US and Britain would be, would be, would be happy about that, as they claim to be pro-development, right? But in reality, they were, they were pissed, <laughs> because these new policies meant that they, they were losing their access to cheap labor, to cheap raw materials, and to markets in the global south. And they were, they were not going to have that. So they started intervening. Uh, by deposing democratically elected leaders across the South in a series of coups. And yet, despite those coups, uh, Salvador Allende, you know, Arbenz in Chile, in, Chile, Arbenz in Guatemala, um, etc., despite those coups, the South was still rising. They were learning how to work together. They were arguing for a fair global economy. In 1973, they passed in the halls of the United Nations a proposal for what they called a new international economic order, which argued for a fair global economy. The, the North was on the back foot. They were trying to figure out what can we do to stop the rise of the South as they're ruining our whole game. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but, and so they met in 1975 in Chateau Rambouillet in France to devise a plan. They never got a chance to enact their plan because something happened in 1980 that changed the course of world history forever. And that was the third world debt crisis. The United States jacked up interest rates on the dollar. Uh, that meant that, uh, that foreign loans uh, that developing countries had needed for their own development, um, uh, the interest rates on those loans increased. They couldn't repay them. They, they came to the brink of defaults. The US, uh, who had most of the, the loans, said, no, if you default, our financial system is going to collapse. Uh, and, so, and we'll invade you if you default, uh, uh, basically. And so they said, we will roll over your debts if you, uh, if you agree to give us control over major macroeconomic policy decisions in your countries. So just a couple of decades after independence from colonialism, power was shifted from, from sovereign pol parliaments in global south countries to technocrats and bankers in New York, London, and Washington. And they imposed what we call structural adjustment programs um, that uh, brought in austerity, cuts to social spending, privatization of public uh, companies and resources, um, and market liberalization exactly the opposite of the policies that had been working so well for both the West and the Global South in the 50s, 60s. Um, and as a result, uh, this was the, the single biggest uh, driver of impoverishment in, in the Global South after colonialism. And on the timeline, what was the date when uh, bankers, technocrats, politicians, and other so-called leaders decided that this, uh, to structurally adjust uh, other right. countries. What was that date? So that was in 1980. Um, in, in the early 1980s was, was when this first started. Now what's interesting is that the exact same policies in the wake of the financial crisis in the West have been imposed on uh, Western countries themselves, right? So structural adjustment um, used to be uh, just for um, brown people around the world. Uh, nobody in the West really cared what happened to them, even though it was devastating. Uh, these days, we're seeing those same policies being visited on our own countries, on uh, Spain, on Ireland, on Portugal, on, on Italy, et cetera, with devastating, and Greece, of course, with devastating consequences. It's ironic, isn't it, that the rent seekers, the people who extract all this rent, uh, whether it be through loans or, or resources, um, have turned on their own people? Yeah, I think it's interesting. It really shows you that um, as capitalism reaches uh, points of crisis, that the, uh, the circle of us begins to shrink ever smaller, right? So before um, you know, Europe or the, or the West more broadly um, could, could see the global South as a kind of sacrifice zone uh, for plunder to maintain their economies, right? But these days, uh, they're even sabotaging their own backyard, Southern Europe, for example, um, for the sake of maintaining the status quo in the, in the core economies like Germany and Britain. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's really an indication that, uh, that we're now beginning to colonize ourselves in a way. And now, of course, we're, out, we're outraged by this, but, uh, but the same policies were being visited on global south countries in the 1980s, and uh, you know, there was not as much outrage because it wasn't affecting us. 
Um, so really, in a way, the chickens are coming home to roost, and, uh, and it's time that we recognize that um, we need to unite in solidarity across borders, um, across the, the north-south divide, um, in, in resisting these harmful policies. How do we do that? Well, so there are a lot of solutions that we can start considering. One that I mentioned earlier was, uh, was uh, the importance of democratizing the institutions of global governance, the World Bank and the IMF. It's completely ludicrous that in the 21st century, these uh, organizations which decide the rules of the global economy are controlled by a small handful of rich countries in terms of voting power. How hopeful are you about addressing this? Um, Meaningfully addressing it? Yeah, I, I, do have, I do have some hope that some of the new kinds of politics that are emerging in, say, the US and Britain r right now um, might get us towards Western economies um, making decisions that are fair to the rest of the world. I do think that's a possibility. But I think that if there is going to be change, it's going to come from below. I think it's going to come from the South. It's going to come from civil society movements that have, that have been engaged for the past number of decades, arguing for a fair global economy, arguing for a fair voice in the WTO and the World Bank and the IMF, arguing for fair trade rules, etc. cetera. Um, it's going to be down to those already existing um, movements that we need to start supporting. That's, that's the direction we need to put our passion into and not into uh, depoliticizing and demoralizing charity schemes. Optimistic. I, I have to be, I suppose, otherwise I, otherwise I would quit my job and just hole up. <laughs> Where would you um, hole up? <laughs> I guess in my office and just write some more. <laughs> um, um, Jason, thank you very much. This has been a wonderful um, conversation, uh, so enlightening, and also a huge thank you for the book because it's such a valuable contribution. I'm really glad you enjoyed it, and thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure. That's it from Renegade Inc. HQ this week. You can drop the team a mail, studio at renegadeinc.com, or tweet us at Renegade Inc. We'd love to hear from you. Join us next week for more insight from those people who are thinking differently. But until then, stay curious. <laughs>